Philo, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. Not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, man. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Uh, the Steel Documentary Monday. This is part two of the Charles Bronson Cutting Edge Documentary Prison. Pretty interesting stuff, man. Let's get back into this, man. The routine in solitary confinement is very easy to describe. It just consists of 23, often 24 hours a day, locked in a cell. Mark Leach, a former armed robber, spent nearly 20 years in prison and knows what it's like to be in total isolation in the block. It was only when I was in solitary confinement that I used to understand why the lion paces his cage. Not because he wants to look about, it's because he's bored off his head. It's because he's got nothing else to do, he's got no stimulus. So you pace up and down, up and down, and you get to the point where you do it with your eyes closed. That's the way that you survive. You walk up and down yourself for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, day after day after day. That's torture. It's not a kind of psychological torture, warfare going on in a segregation unit. It's a world upon itself. I mean, your average inmate's not fully versed with the reality of what goes on in the segregation unit. Behind those three closed doors, the reality is that they can do what the hell they like and nobody seems to ask any questions. They would kick your door in the night time, excessively, um, as you're going to sleep. Um, as a cat's going to you have the light on all the time. Turn the light off and on, bang your flap. Their job was to make life as uncomfortable as possible and to break you, basically. Some people see me in these glasses and they might think that I'm wearing them to be flash, be different or whatever, but I don't. I feel like I've had 22 years in solitary. My fucking eyes are so sensitive to light, you just don't realise it and I get a lot of headaches. Oh, you lose your head. The wall's closing on you. You get through it. He looked like uh, the, the Mandarin from uh, Iron Man. It's you sometimes collapse with a state of exa uh, mental exhaustion and anxiety. You become uh, totally numb and alienated towards yourself as well as others. You lose your perception of reality, and then after a while you become accustomed to it. And then the more damaging side of the effect is that you need the block. The block becomes somewhat of a cocoon for you. It's far easier to curl up into a ball in that little cell and pretend the world don't exist. You get to a peak where really you don't mind the door not being open and just shove my food in the door if necessary. You don't wish to see other human beings because it's all a very, very strange and painful process. The dangers are that you risk creating a person three or four times as dangerous as the one you put in there. Facts. I've gone months and months and months without seeing the sky or having a kind word or a nice thought. I've laughed so much. I've got into a fit. A fit of madness. But there's no more pain. There's just an empty hole. In solitary, Charlie has spent countless hours bodybuilding. He often does thousands of press-ups in a day and could do 25 with two men on his back. Damn! Two grown men? Over the years, not all prison officers have treated Charlie badly. At Belmarsh Prison, where Jim Dawkins worked, they decided to relax his regime. When I first heard that Charlie was coming to Belmarsh, we just expected to be going home every night with broken noses and black eyes. We found a different side of the man. Initially, when he arrived, we gave him one hour's exercise a day, which, which is the wrong... I think Bogus is ill for setting him up like this. Why is he on a picketed fence with the with the prison in the background and these khakis like this? Much of every prisoner, really. We began to play badminton, scrabble, um, helped helped him train with Bertha, his medicine ball. He really was quite intelligent and witty, and he, he had the decency, really, to treat us like individuals. He, he never threatened us at all. Um, so I, I just felt, and, and certainly the other guys felt, that, that he deserved that decency back from us as well. It's a fact. You know, you always got to go in with a grain of salt thinking like, would is it a setup? to but... have been involved in beating Charlie up and because Charlie was, was held on this sort of pedestal where he was classed as the, the most dangerous prisoner in the system, obviously you get your, your, your macho 
Metro men who decide that they, they want to knock him off there. The, the stories that I've heard range from him actually getting his moustache ripped out in one prison. He's received broken fingers from officers stamping or kicking him on his hands, um, using batons to break, or to attempt to break his hands or fingers. Um, he's been kicked in the he's testicles. Like a wild bitten, animal, man. Pretty much everything, really, that you could think of. But obviously, Charlie was always outnumbered, sort of, at least five, Seven six to one. Seven to one. Six to one. The prison strategy is to move Charlie regularly. Jim Dawkins accompanied him from Belmarsh to Bristol. When we arrived at Bristol, there was a heavy amount of prison officers waiting at the segregation unit, what looked like the, the biggest screws in the prison at the time. We were told we're not Charlie did that not care. What the fuck? routine that you had with him up there. He's, he's going to be in the box 23 hours a day, and that's it. He always makes the effort to take one step forward, and then the system seems to push him back two steps. I felt sad, really, that we'd left him in those sort of conditions again. Another source of sympathy for Charlie it, my man. was a psychiatrist who had been invited by the governor of Parkhurst to study the prison's hard core of disruptive inmates. He was Dr. Bob Johnson. We had a very good session. These are really his drawings. These are wild. These are tough. I like these. I look, think, look at the nose on that man right there. I think, uh, we established a relationship then where he began to trust me and started discussing some of the roots of his emotional problems. I discussed his childhood influences because uh, the approach I have to violent and dangerous individuals is that the roots of the violence and the danger and the risk comes from their childhood experiences. Charlie wrote to Dr. Johnson for help. Here he sees that what he does is what he does not want to do. He does not want to suffer from these outbursts, these tantrums. And he knows that if he takes the steps that he wishes to take, these will cut down. This will help him. He writes to me like this. I write to the Home Secretary and I get nowhere. The reason they deny me access to they Charlie don't care? is it's actually what I'm doing is ideologically opposed to what they're doing. For Dr. Johnson, the answer is therapy. It goes against the, moment, the grain. What are they doing? More and more repression, more and more restriction, more and more destruction of human rights, of his dignity, of his self-esteem, more and more destruction. It's appalling. He is convinced his work with other inmates like Charlie has been a success. The evidence that the authority should take into account is the evidence from the special unit I worked at in Parkhurst, in Sea Wing. There, the incidence of violence went right down from one every two months to one every two years. That's over 95% reduction in violence. I read the papers where he comes up to these problems, he trashes his cell, or he takes the kidnapping, or something, and he's going to kill somebody, or he's going to kill himself. This is a risk. Now, if, we, if I got access to him and we could un work on these emotional problems, these, this risk would evaporate. Hold on, real quick, real quick, real quick. I'm going to probably edit this out. Don't even worry about it. Uh, real quick. I got to do so. No, 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 no. I'm going to edit it out. Don't worry. Don't worry. Because I'm still here. You can hear me, right? Okay, then. That's all that really matters at the end of the day is that my voice is carrying through I'm just trying to post this last video man y'all 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 understand right y'all probably I don't even know what I'm talking because this coming out the video it's not gonna be there it's edited it's gonna be an edited version because at the end of the day I am and will always be one of the best editors on YouTube you feel me? One of, if not the best. And I hold that title near and dear to me. You feel what I'm saying? All right, we back. Told y'all. Y'all ain't even see most of that. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. When Charlie was jailed in 1974, he soon lost contact with his ex-wife, Irene, and small child, Michael. Irene decided it was best to keep the true identity of Michael's father a secret from him. I never said anything at all about his dad. He never asked. If he'd have asked, maybe... Irene is bogus. He never asked. 
was apparently he used to talk to his sister quite She gonna always be bogus. But he didn't like to say anything to me in case he upset me. Because I'd made a new life, I had a new family, it was a long time ago. Irene ain't he S-H-I-T. He, he was, you know, was really playing on his mind all the time. He's always had a chip on his shoulder about it. In he know now. Charlie asks childhood friend Ray Williams to find his son for him. Ray, who still knows Charlie as Mickey Peterson, tracked down Irene and phoned her. It's understandable, really, why he wants to get in touch. He's been 23 years. He's worried about his lad. He really would like to get in touch with his lad. I said, all he wants to do is know how his son is. I said, and if you could pass the message on to his son, if he doesn't want to know about his dad, he'll, nothing else will okay, be what she say? mentioned about it. When Ray phoned up, I mean, I used to have nightmares about it because when I divorced him, when I divorced Mick, I mean, it was a very long time ago, years and years and years, a lifetime away. I'd had no contact whatsoever with him. I didn't know anything about him other than what I'd read in the papers. And the papers were saying that he's like Hannibal Lecter and he was a maniac and, and he was mad and all sorts of... But you know that man. You know that man's heart. He married you. You know how he really moving. So you believe in what the papers said? Things and it's frightening. You, you believe and you think, oh, he must have, he must be like that now. Michael arranged to go with Ray to meet his father in Wakefield Prison. I hate her. I've read the part in the past and that, and I thought, what, what, what not to, you know? I was so nervous, it was unbelievable. So, I, you know, we got in the car and that, and it took about two hours to get there. And uh, the feelings were going through me were crazy, you know, like, will I like him? Will he get on, you know, what's he look like? And, is he really as mad as what everyone thinks he is? It was just unbelievable, even the, the, the look on both the faces. I couldn't believe it, the size of him and that, and I just first thing I'd done, I started crying, yeah. And I jumped over to him, ran up to him, a big cuddle and that, and like, even he was crying, you know, under his, like, shades. It was such, uh, such an emotional time. It looked like him. Uh, and his, his, his dad was so proud to see his lad and young Michael was so made up to see his dad after 23 years. He was such a nice person, Joe. You know? And I thought, what, what is he doing in there, you know, after all these years? Travelling back in the car, young Michael, he was actually, he was actually crying, I mean, he was just, just couldn't believe, you know, he'd met his dad. I said to him, I'll keep out of trouble if you keep out of trouble and that, and it did have kept me out of trouble, do you know what I mean? Because I, I think I was going to head that the same way myself. I know now that he's not this maniac that the papers make out. Because I read his letters that he sends to Mike. I know he's not like that at all. It's just all the press. Charlie had promised Michael that he would I don't want to look at her. Oh but my his God. darkest it's hour was yet to come. I know now. Shut up. Oh. What the hell was that? What's going on? I'm lost. This is the Black oh. Museum of Gloucestershire, uh, okay. regarded by many as being politically incorrect. Uh, it touches on many taboo subjects. Can you believe, for example, that that is a genuine Ku Klux Klan outfit for a three to four year old? Yes, I can believe it. I believe that the Crime Through Time Museum houses the largest private Holocaust collection in the world. Pride of place in this part of the museum must go to the celebrity figure, Charles Bronson. On display, there are several items, including his fob watch on display, which was given to him from the legendary figure of Ronnie Cray. <laughs> Charlie is 
a winner and Charlie is a marketable commodity. We've got the books about Charlie, we've got the pens, we've got merchandise that includes posters, hats, videos, we've got CD-ROMs, we've got Everything. floppy disks, we've got the film coming out and we've got music CDs. For a man that has spent in excess of 23 years in solitary confinement, he's been gifted with exceptional strengths. Charlie is everybody's hero in one way or another, and even if it means anti-hero. We'd all okay. like to be able to get into a cell with a paedophile for half an hour and give them what for. There'd be nothing better than going in there with a baseball bat, you know, getting a paedophile's hand, putting it on a concrete plinth, and giving it what for. But come to... Now, I understand what he's talking about. I feel it, but I don't condone this, YouTube. Just, just to let you know, I do not condone any type of violence that he's talking about. I'm just here reacting, but I do feel it. I understand it. Do what you gotta do. To that, <laughs> who would actually do that? No Charlie. one, they'd all bottle out. But when Charlie does that, they say, yeah, that's right. Charlie's done one over. Charlie's kicked a pedophile's door in, a cell door, steel door. But the authorities then go, oh, Charlie's a nasty character. Let's put this propaganda out here about Charlie and let's make him look bad. I've had other certificates, for example, which show that he lifted weights with his, his beard. There's a certificate of having done 1,790 sit-ups in one hour with a medicine ball. The general public are interested oh. in Charlie because of something called curiosity. We're all curious of what goes on somewhere that we can't get at. If it was Charlie here now, talking about himself, about his life, who might be interested in that? They may just go, well, yes, Me? we've heard it all before, this con and that ex-con and so on. Uh, I've never heard of him. But because they haven't allowed Charlie to talk, because Charlie is inaccessible, Charlie, to some extent, may be a myth. And people are intrigued by that. There's, there's many, many stories. Jan Lam was reported as having said that she okay. had the greatest name. When Charlie's released, take it from me, I think we'll have newspapers, we'll have TV shows fighting over that man for the first six months to get him on the show. And I think that there'll be an open checkbook there for him. But for now, that checkbook remains firmly closed. Firmly. In January last year, Phil Danielson was a local authority teacher working with inmates in a unit at Hull Prison where Charlie was being kept heard the door open and the next thing I knew I was on the floor. I knew I'd been thumped and really it wasn't until I heard the voice of the person who'd done it that I knew it was Bromson. I soon became aware that all these brave prison officers had scarpered pretty quickly and I later found out that the other five or six inmates that were on that wing had actually gone into their cells and plot themselves in. Fairly shortly after that would trash the entire place. I believe we were talking about something like £500,000 worth of damage. And he spent a good half an hour to an hour totally trashing. If it moved, he trashed it. And that only added to my fear, because can you imagine the noise? Probably the first three hours were the most frightening time when I was tied up and I thought he was going to kill me. Definitely thought he was going to kill me. I knew how physically powerful he was. I knew he could probably kill me with one blow actually physically picked me up above his head, that's how strong he is, uh, and lifted me and put me onto the snooker table in the middle of the wing. And you've got to bear in mind that while he was doing this, he was like screaming like a banshee. I'm talking here about Damn. a guy that can physically pick up a very large fridge freezer and throw it up a staircase on his own. He taped or tied the big kitchen knife to the end of a pool cue which effectively made it into a spear. He said, you keep quiet. Not that I was making any noise anyway, because this knife, take your last breath, because this knife's going in you. Have you heard of a film, a movie called uh, Dead Men Walking? He sit and forced me to watch Dead Men Walking, which is, as you, I'm sure you know, it's Susan Sarandon and uh, the never, guy never seen it. Madonna. Um, it's about a guy who's on death row 
Well, not, not the most, it's hardly a Hollywood musical. It's not like somebody popping on the sound of music to cheer everybody up. You know, it's hardly sort of, um, and all, all Bronson could say is, it's a really good film, that is. Really good film, you know. And I thought, yeah, I know why you're doing that. I thought, you've got a cruel streak. It's not just, oh, poor Charlie, you've got a cruel streak. Because can you imagine how I felt having to watch that thing? I mean, you know, being tied to a chair in front of the television, told to watch it, and he stood behind me, chuckling away at it. He took great pride at one point in saying that I was the only one of his hostages who hadn't physically shit himself. <laughs> he really admired me for that. You had them so uh, he... clenched up, boy. You had just used the bathroom, that's why. Don't be too proud. I know you just used the Your bathroom. Your goal in life is to get ordinary humane people to physically shit themselves. Well, I'm sorry, but there's something not quite right. Yeah, we've been knew that, my boy. Said that he'd taken me hostage because I was the bastard who'd slagged off his artwork. And actually, that is not true. It never was true. We started on his demands. We're going to Cuba on a helicopter. We want a helicopter to go to Cuba. I think some sort of machine guns, which I think he'd seen in some film. But eventually, Charlie agreed to surrender himself, provided he was allowed to see his solicitor, boy, and that there would be no punishment beating from officers. Bizarrely, however, he wanted to extend the siege for a second night. He knew that if it went on for, as, for 44 hours, that it would be like the longest, and he was looking for the record breaker. That's why he did another night. It changed absolutely nothing. Half past nine, on the Wednesday morning, he said, I want you to march in parallel with me, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, up and down, up and down. And he said, at 10 o'clock, he said, you just carry on walking. He got to 10 o'clock, I just bolted. I absolutely bolted for that gate. Got up out of there, boy. I like to walk in the, on the beach because it, it was an image that all the time I was um, held hostage that I kept conjuring up. I just imagine myself walking on the beach. I wonder how life is for like somebody that was held hostage. Like, what, what's the PTSD like? I'm curious. About six months after the incident, I suppose I had what would be commonly termed a nervous breakdown. I'm diagnosed with having post-traumatic stress disorder. See, I know it's the there. The end of siege was only the beginning. For Still you? going on. You know, a career I loved is ruined, and I don't know whether I'm going to be able to work. Lots of people who've been through ordeals like this are changed completely because they are damaged. And in a sense, that's what I am. I'll never be the same again. In February this year, Charles Bronson went to trial for the siege. Having sacked his lawyers, he attempted to defend himself. Shortly before the trial, he rehearsed his plea to the jury over the phone to a friend. Much he get? His defense was that the system was to blame because prison had created him. Up in the a jury's not gonna understand that. Man. My window is a steel grid, and I have to put my lips against that steel grid and suck in air. I've done nothing on this planet to deserve that. My bed is four inches off the floor. It's a concrete bed. Now, if that's right. Then be so. But let somebody else have a fucking go of it. Because I've had 26 years of this bollocks. And it's time to come out. But I'm not living. I'm existing. I suck. Thank you. The future That's of a great opening is not statement a thing. right there. That's a great opening argument, though. Look at it. We're almost done, huh? Yeah. Gentlemen of the jury, please stand. Okay. On the charge of criminal damage, do you find Charles Bronson guilty or not guilty? Guilty. On the charge of yeah, false imprisonment, do you find Charles Bronson 
guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Ooh. Although nobody knows what is in your mind, your victims all have the same fear, that they're about to lose their lives. You're dangerous and unpredictable, especially when you're upset and angry. Whilst there may not be any mental illness, there is clearly a continuing problem. The community at large, whether on the outside or in prison, deserves some protection from you. I consider that you will continue to be a danger, which is why I have to pass a sentence of life imprisonment. Charlie will not be eligible to apply for parole before 2010. Okay, By folks, then, life? he will be 57 years old. When Damn, is he thought to stop? And where, how on earth can we ever, ever consider uh, releasing him unless he's been graced the opportunity to rehabilitate himself and address his offending behaviour? Oh, come 57, on. 57, he's I 67, think that the system has got a great deal to answer for. I think um, the public needs... My man went in there for originally for a seven-year sentence as has been in there for six educating and the politicians need educating prison is well never killed nobody to be an expensive way of making never sold a drug people worse very disappointed in him um, why um, i've been very very hurt something i'll never ever forget but he's too much they better not show irene no more i do not I'm want to see to irene i'm gonna win i'm gonna get out I'm going to be free. I want to be free. Some people might think I'm institutionalised. Some people might think, ah, Charlie's been in there too long. They probably say, he loves it in prison. Well, I fucking don't love it in prison. I want to go home. Hey, free Charlie Bronson, man. Tell leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells.